Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James Corbett, publisher of the CorbettReport.com and editorial writer for the International Forecaster. He's speaking to us from Japan. Welcome back to the show, James. Thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure to be here. And I hope that you and your family came out okay after that horrible typhoon that hit Japan recently. Yes. Uh, well, thankfully, from our perspective, it didn't come anywhere near our part of the country. But, uh, of course, it did hit on the eastern uh, seaboard and did cause quite a bit of damage, including 11 deaths. So uh, not a happy story uh, overall. China right now is hosting the G20. Prime Minister Trudeau is there. And... Uh, He's uh, put an application in to join the Asian, I I think, uh, infrastructure fund or funding structure, something like that. Would that be the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Yes. What is that, and is it a really big deal? Well, it is from the perspective of the uh, existing status quo uh, system for infrastructure investment in Asia, which is has traditionally been uh, funded by the Asia Development Bank, which is more in the Japan slash U.S. Western axis of power. And the AIIB is an alternative to that started by China. Uh, I believe it officially launched last year and was uh, running up to the launch in the year before that. But it did garner quite a bit of notoriety at the time because it did represent a a sort of alternative to that ADB structure. And it was also uh, quite uh, in the open opposed by the United States. And the UK, of course, was the first to break ranks and say that they were going to join the AIIB as a partner and uh, basically threw that in the US's face. And so um, the more Western countries that sign up to it, the, the more that really goes against the, the traditional structure, which is in that ADB, World Bank, IMF type orbit. Well, after the U.S., China is Canada's biggest trading partner, and our record of trade with China goes back to the 60s, where we traded a lot of grain to them. Prime Minister Trudeau was the first major diplomat or politician to visit China. Of course, Nixon got all the publicity, but we broke the ice Does Canada enjoy kind of a special relationship with China because we seem to be a little friendlier, a little less formal? I don't know if I would say special relationship. That brings up some uh, geopolitical connotations. But it is, I think, a more uh, or a less contentious relationship than, say, between China and the U.S., which, of course, is a more important relationship internationally in terms of its ramifications on the overall global order. The Canada-China relationship not quite as fraught with uh, geopolitical tensions and ramifications. So I think there's more room for a more comfortable relationship. So I think there is, and there are obviously overlapping interests, and obviously China it remains, even with its slowdown, remains a, uh, a very hungry importer of raw materials. And Canada, of course, always an exporter of raw materials and looking perhaps to diversify from its main trading partner, the United States. And so it does represent something of a natural relationship. So it shouldn't be all that surprising that Canada and China fit together fairly nicely. And uh, the, of course, there's always the concerns about China's human rights records and things like that. But as I say, I, that's more contentious in the U.S. relationship, and Canada can be seen to go under the radar on those issues, mostly. Any more fallout after that international ruling saying China's move to build these artificial islands in the South China Sea is illegal? Well, it is obviously an ongoing point of tension, and uh, as I understand it, there are the moves underway in ASEAN uh, the countries to try to settle some sort of agreement um, in in terms of the overall use of the South China Sea. Uh, obviously, we're still some ways away from that. And as I understand it, that's going to be at least one of the issues that's going to be floating around 
uh, at the G20, though obviously hosted in China, and uh, specifically between Abe and Xi, who are going to be meeting at the summit and presumably talking about the East China Sea. So there are obviously ongoing tensions and debate there, and nothing has been settled one way or the other, but it is going to be a point of geopolitical tension and, uh, and certainly a sticking point in negotiations between a lot of these countries in the near future. Has there been any talk of sanctions? Uh, not that I've seen, um, but that would, uh, I, I think that would be a significant escalation. But it's certainly, I would imagine, on the table uh, at the point at which there is a more formal agreement uh, and that uh, agreement is broken. At this point, this was uh, the, the, the latest um, thing that you're referring to in the South China Sea was this UN arbitration panel that came out with this ruling that China's uh, use of the South China Sea and, and places that are in the ambit of the Philippines and other uh, South China Sea bordering nations is illegal and they should um, they should back off. But that was a an outside, it was a UN arbitration panel uh, that China never recognized the uh, the jurisdiction of. And there are a number of countries within China's uh, orbit that agreed with them on that point. So it was never... It was never something that they agreed to that they uh, breached. Um, the idea that there is going to be more of a formal agreement that uh, that will be slotted into place, I think at that point, if China goes and breaks that agreement, that would be the point at which sanctions would probably be the, the first level of, uh, of kickback against that. Is there any concern being expressed in China about the loss of jobs to robots? Apparently, Adidas is shutting down their plants in China, putting about a million people out of work and moving them back to Germany, where robots will make the running shoes. I haven't seen a lot of reaction um, coming from China about this, but it is, I think, I don't think it's causing waves of unemployment at this point, but I think there is the sense that this is a the next generation manufacturing step, and uh, the, the writing is on the wall in that sense. But uh, to a certain extent, China has been, with all its might for the last several years, trying to diversify from being merely a manufacturing uh, nation into more of a, a diversified economy. And uh, they still have a few years yet, I think, before the robot armies are going to be taking over all manufacturing. So uh, the real question is, can they steer that ship around and actually make themselves into a, uh, a, a diversified economy that can withstand the, the loss of manufacturing jobs? And that certainly remains to be seen, especially given the fact that China is going through a slowdown, and the only thing really keeping the Chinese economy going at this point is uh, easy credit. The B.C. government's 15% tax on Greater Vancouver real estate is now a month old. Is there any more reaction in Asia about it? Uh, there is, and uh, as I said the last time we talked, there the, the jury was still out on whether this was going to have a significant effect. It seems to be having an effect. Uh, in fact, we have uh, the Chinese language uh, real estate online portal called juwai.com. Um, and we, f- we see that searches for Vancouver property have fallen um, by nearly 10% since the tax went into effect. So clearly there is an effect. And that effect is most uh, measurable in the decline in searches for homes that are listed above $1 million. There's been a 55% drop in searches for homes over $1 million in the Vancouver uh, real estate uh, market, which is interesting um, because obviously it shows that there are people who are being deterred from those uh, those big ticket uh, property purchases by the tax. But the inevitable in, in unintended consequences of such things, it, there has been a spike in searches for below $1 million uh, properties, which is actually... Uh, probably even worse news for the Vancouver uh, real estate market overall or for, you know, actual Canadians who are looking to get into that market because what it really implies is that instead of buying the the over $1 million properties that a lot of people couldn't afford anyway, now they're going into the sub $1 million market uh, where you're looking at condos and single family homes that really would be used by average Canadian families that are now at least in the crosshairs of these Chinese investors. So really, it might have just moved everything down the scale, which will ultimately, again, just drive prices up further. Sure, in the Fraser Valley and in Victoria and Vancouver Island. Exactly right. So this may, again, the jury is still out. We'll see whether this these searches actually manifest as actual purchases. But at any rate, it seems that it might just be bringing the bottom end of the market up and, and the top end down. We'll have more James Corbett right after the break.
I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with James Corbett. James, any more consumer fallout in Japan with negative interest rates discour- discouraging people who want to save money? Well, I, I'm not sure I would characterize it as fallout so much as just continuation of what has become the status quo here. Um, the anemic spending continues in Japan really unabated, and that continues despite not only the continuation of the negative interest rate policy, but also uh, the stimulus which was announced uh, earlier this, well, was announced earlier this summer, but implemented uh, earlier this month. And the stimulus uh, is like every stimulus that is ever announced in Japan, not quite what it seems. Uh, uh, Bloomberg actually has a, a really good breakdown of this, where they go through all of the announced stimulus, uh, stimulus packages for the past 15 years, and they show what the total announced size of the package is versus what was actually new spending. Uh, that was generated by the package, and it's it's generally about maybe a half, maybe a third, uh, sometimes uh, more like 10%. Uh, so, for example, this latest stimulus package was this 28 trillion yen package that was just announced by the Abe government, about 6 trillion yen of which is actually new spending. The rest is uh, going to be just basically reallocated from other parts of the budget and uh, reallocated for other things. So, really, it's going to have a much smaller effect than you would expect from the headline number. And even on top of that, uh, again, it's just pork barrel politics for the most part, giving infrastructure loans to uh, government uh, crony corporations that can then develop uh, infrastructure in constituencies that vote you know, the right way, i.e. for the ruling party. So a, a lot of the kind of status quo going on there, and it is expected to have very little effect on the actual pro- product productivity of the economy, which is really the underlying problem at this point. Uh, there's uh, a lot of talk here about the, uh, for example, the latest headline number looks very good. The Japanese unemployment rate has just hit a two-decade low. Uh, it has just hit 3% in July, the lowest for 21 years, which sounds like a great, amazing number. 3% unemployment sounds like the economy is great. But again, you have to take into effect the, uh, the fact that most jobs here in Japan at that lower end of the scale that are, are really just created to make that unemployment number very low. So you have a lot of makeshift jobs that are not very important, like uh, uh, people directing traffic in parking lots and things like this that are obviously very low pay and are really just there to, to uh, make that unemployment number a little bit lower and don't really contribute uh, in any significant amount, uh, in any significant way to the productive economy. So it's a lot of trickery like that. And that combined with the fact that now the Bank of Japan with its ETF buying is set to become the largest shareholder in uh, 55 different major Japanese companies by the end of next year, if their current spending habits uh, continue. That's a pretty uh, incredible number. And it shows that essentially what this it, what is happening right now is a nationalization of the economy in the attempt, in some sort of attempt to uh, to prop up markets as if this is somehow going to create a more productive economy. It really isn't changing the fundamental productivity of the economy uh, or its competitiveness on the international scale. So uh, I really don't see anything that's that's coming along to change that in a fundamental way right now. It looks like Japan's almost falling into the same economic trap the Soviet Union did, where it hired little old ladies to sweep sidewalks and streets and buff headstones and graveyards and stuff. But they weren't really productive jobs, and they were a drain on their economy. And look what happened to the Soviet Union. Yes. And to be fair, I think this is uh, certainly in the post-war era. I think this has generally been the way it's it's gone. It's uh, sort of a community obligation to make sure that everyone has some sort of job. So I think that that's always been a feature of the Japanese economy, but it just goes to show that the headline numbers, like 3% unemployment, don't necessarily mean what you think they would mean from a Canadian context. Is Japan making any efforts to boost their birth rate, which is horribly low right now? Uh, there are a, a number of efforts. I think that they are haphazard and not 
particularly well coordinated. They generally are initiated by the prefectural government, sometimes even at the municipal level, and involve various benefits and uh, and stimulus uh, for for couples that are having children. But it doesn't obviously seem to be making a particularly large change in the actual habits of the Japanese people, who and there is continuing to be a, a shrinking of the population, and that isn't changing at this point. So um, Japan is still technically a dying country, um, and I believe the the milestone was passed last year where the Japanese population was shrinking and there were more deaths than births. Well, Canada has just started its child benefit program where parents get 6400 bucks per year for each child under the age of 6 and $5,400 for each child age 6 to 17. Obviously, they're trying to do something here if it's not just the birth rate, help middle-class families just survive, you know, the high cost of children. Is the high cost of having a child in Japan the biggest deterrent to having children there? I think it's that combined with a bleak economic future, combined with uh, cultural changes and, and pressures that are going on here, where it is uh, a phenomenon that's been talked about, and I think overplayed in a lot of the Western media, the, oh, isn't Japan so weird, look at all these weird trends, that that sort of thing often gets reported on for um, little reason, or very uh, they, they, they overblow the story, but I think there is a phenomenon here of younger people being less interested in, in dating or ha- starting a family, and that is translating into uh, later and later age for couples marrying and having children and fewer and fewer people ultimately having uh, children. So uh, that is a, a, a sort of cultural trend that, again, I think is is baked into the cake to a certain extent here. And I think there are underlying economic reasons for that as well. Again, one can imagine in the post-war period when Japan was booming and the economy was growing, it was a much more stable environment and people were much more comfortable with having children. But now in times where the belt is tightening and it looks like it will only get tighter from here. Um, one can understand people's trepidation in getting into the family business, as it were. Do people have to pay for school? Uh, yes. And that uh, obviously, again, like in the West, there's property taxes and that sort of thing, which are diverted to schools. But it's not just school, uh, the public schooling system, but there's also, of course, the cram schools, which I think have some notoriety uh, in Canada and elsewhere, where uh, basically most children will be sent to cram schools after their regular school, even from elementary school, but certainly from junior high on, uh, where they will spend another few hours. And of course, there are costs associated with that. And then costs obviously associated with uh, post-secondary education. So it is a significant amount of money that is ultimately spent on education here. Are there any economic highlights that people could look forward to in Japan? I really wish there was something tangible that I could point to. And I, I if, if there is, I truly don't see it. Um, barring some sort of game-changing technological innovation, barring some sort of very strange or new demographic trend, barring some sort of event that's going to change the system fundamentally, I really don't see a way out of it at this point because... Japan's uh, economy is structured around these corporations that have existed for a very long time in a sort of rut of the status quo. They are not particularly known for innovation. And the days of Sony, you know, changing markets with new technology like Walkmans and things like that are certainly, I think, in the past at this point. So it really would require some very new ideas. Uh, and that is not something that uh, Japan is known for at this point. James, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thank you for, again for having me on. My guest has been James Corbett, publisher of The Corbett Report and editorial writer for The International Forecaster. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. You can find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.